Hi everyone, this is Eric from Futurely and I'm here to cover another session of our Keyshot Crash Course. Today's session will be about cameras mostly, but along the way we'll also touch upon some scene management tips and we'll end up setting up our final rendering and post-processing it with the built-in image settings of Keyshot. So the model I have here is a part of New York and the way we got this model is through modeling. I'm kidding, we didn't model any of this. The way we got this model is through Autodesk InfraWorks. And basically there's tons of YouTube tutorials out there that show you how to do this. But for the sake of the tutorial, we're still going to upload this model uh, in the link in the description so that you guys can follow the tutorial. The other model I have here is a project by Alex Ahmad. He basically provided this model of a tower he did so that we can take this course further. And so thank you so much, Alex. We really, really appreciate it. We're not going to be able to upload this model in the link in the description uh, because of authorship reasons. But basically, you can load in any of your models and follow the tutorial that way, basically. And so if you bring your own model around and you realize that it's a bit too big or a bit too small or a bit displaced, what you can do is click on your model here from the scene and then go to position here and then use your move tool to not only move your object and rotate it, but also scale it. So the main problem that I have here is the scale. And what I'm going to do is come to the scale here, which is used for the uniform scale. And I can see it says 10, I'm gonna make it one. And that will make my model much smaller. And you can just move it in place and rotate it even, like we mentioned before. And if it's not sticking directly to your model, what you can do is make it hover a bit above your model and then click on snap to lower object here. And if that doesn't work, Try it again. <laughs> Let's try this one more time. All right, it worked now. And that will basically snap your model directly to what's under it. And that's pretty, pretty cool. Now I'm gonna turn off this model and I'm gonna turn on the other ones that I have and get started with the real part of the tutorial. So let's sign some materials to some parts of this model. Let's go to tune here. I'm going to sign this shaded tune material to my site. And when I start doing that, you can see that each part is taking this material separately. And I don't want to go ahead and assign every part separate materials. So I'm going to this model that I have here for the site. And once I highlight that, what I can do is directly drag and drop this material onto the highlighted part here. And that will make this whole model with all of its part take this material right away. And you can see how good that looks actually. And um, the thing is, if I want to maybe make the roads darker, I'm going to go for the matte black material here. And I try to assign a material here. The whole model is going to take that material from, the, from now on. And I don't want that to happen. So I'm going to go to scene and I'm going to click on this roads here. And once I do that, that part of the model will be highlighted here and I can just drag this material from here. And instead of dropping in the viewport, I'm going to drop it into the part right here. Let's see. Uh, actually, that was the uh, sidewalks, but still looks cool, but not what I want right now. So I'm going to take the roads here and I'm going to drop it into the roads. All right, that's cool. And maybe we can go for highlighting the sidewalks by making these ground parts a bit darker. So I'm going to use control to select all of those parts here. And let's see, yeah, one more here. And I'm going to drag the matte gray material and drop it into the highlighted parts here. And all of those highlighted parts will take that model uh, material, I mean, from now on. And this is pretty cool. So anytime I drag another material and drop it here, you can see that similar parts that have the same material will take the same material basically from now on. And if you don't want that to happen, what you can do is select those parts and right click and then go to material and then 
on-link material from there. I'll do a similar task with the towers. I'm going to take the matte white and drop it into these octagonal elements that I have. And I'm going to do the same here on the other tower. And you can see as soon as I do that, it's going to ask me that a material with the same name already is being used. Do you want to link these materials? Yes, I want to link those materials because I want them to change together later. And I'm going to do the same with this last tower right here. And I'm going to say don't show again so that it gets linked right away. And next time we want to change this material, you can see that it they all take the same material right away. All right, that's cool. Maybe for all of these other parts, I'm going to use a liquid material we made in session number two. And you can get creative and assign it to the site too. That's up to you. Let's do it for the others as well. Now that we've assigned all the materials, we're going to go to cameras and we're gonna go through all of these settings right here. So you can see the first thing we have here is the distance that we can change. So you can zoom in and zoom out with your camera as you do that, but actually it's not really zooming in and out. It's actually going away and going closer to your model. And then there's the azimuth that will orbit around your model. And then there's the inclination, which will um, again go around your model, but in the other direction orthogonally. And then there's the twist, which will basically rotate your camera around the, its target axis, basically. And these are all cool effects. Uh, I'm just going to set this back to zero, all of them. And maybe just for the camera angle that we're going to get, maybe I like this one and I want to keep this. So what I can do is go to my cameras here and I'm going to add a new camera, which will basically save this specific uh, view for me. So I can go back to my old camera and I can see this and then I can go back to this camera anytime. And if I move this around a bit, you're going to see that we have unsaved said next to our camera. That means that if I go back to my other camera and come back to this, it will just not be saved. So if you want to save it, what you can do is just hit the floppy button here and save your current camera. And that's all there is to it in the beginning. And then what we can do is also set camera target. So you can just do that and then you can pick a point and that will set your camera's target to that point. And after that, when you orbit, you're gonna orbit around that point specifically. So if you use your azimuth, you're gonna orbit around that specific point. And then there's the walkthrough mode. If you do that, you're gonna get these uh, arrows that we can use. And you can also use the keyboard arrows to move around. And then there's the ground detection, collision detection, and lock eye height to do all of those. But to be honest, I don't use this so much as of yet. And then there's the standard views that you can use and then go to back view and uh, front and the others. So if you wanna take a snapshot from the top, you can also do this. So there are some standard views you can use here. And then there's the grid that you can uh, turn on and that will help you um, compose your scene better. So for example, if I go to camera two and uh, maybe in the grids, I'm going to go for thirds and that will help me have this rule of thirds grid popping up so I can maybe use it to fit my model into that um, grid and that will make my scene more and better composed. So I'm going to turn off the grid for now and then we're gonna go to the lens settings here and by default it's set to perspective and that means you have a three-point perspective going on about and then we have orthographic. Let's go to orthographic and see. 
you're going to see that your model immediately becomes isometric. And especially for this kind of site views, this is really, really good. I'm going to keep it later on. And then uh, you can also use the standard views with this pretty well. So if you go, let's say, to left, you're going to see that you have a silhouette, like a skyline effect going on about. And then you have this complete elevation-like drawing um, happening for your rendering. So this is really cool, especially with the tune material that we have. It's giving you kind of a drawing-like feeling. And this is a hack actually that you can do whenever you don't feel like drawing from scratch. You can always render it this way. If you're not going to um, give dimensions and things like that, uh, you can always go for this, especially with these kind of models. Um, then there's the shift. Let's go for shift and see how that works. And so you can see, for example, if I go down to the street here, uh, some of these uh, buildings don't have uh, don't have their verticals aligned perfectly. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to hit estimate vertical shift. And once I do that, it will fix the verticals for me right away. And that's really, really cool that it can do that. And then there's the panoramic uh, that we're going to go to. So that's how you use shift for the two-point perspective views. So for the panoramic views what you get is a 360 view from where you're standing. So if you wanna go forward, I'm going to go to perspective again. Maybe I'm gonna walk down the street next to our building. And then I'm going to hit the panoramic view right from here so we can see a 360 view from where we're standing. So this is really, really cool too. I'm going to go back to shift or let's go back to actually the saved version of our camera and I'm going to set this to be orthographic. All right, I'm also going to name this to isometric view. And then maybe let's also go to this first camera and let's also get a perspective in there. I like this city view like perspective so I'm just going to save it and I'm going to rename this as well to city view and so we have these two views to work with during this tutorial now all right so in this city view right here uh, we can do one more thing and that's depth of field so as soon as I turn that on you're gonna see you have a focused element and you have this blur going on um but maybe what you get is something way worse right so the way you can control this is first of all you need to pick a focus point so the way you can do that is click on this button right here and then click on the focal point that you want to set maybe this point right here and that will set everything in that specific distance in focus and the way you can control how much blur you get is using the f-stop. So the lower your f-stop is, the more blur you're going to get. And the higher it is, the less blur you're going to get. So right now I feel like we can make it higher. So I'm going for five, let's say, and this is already cooler, but maybe let's go for 10, um, seven or eight maybe. Actually five was good. I'm just gonna go for five or even four. No, five is nice. And this is also good for the maquette-like um, feel we're trying to go with. And that's because this much depth of field happens in the real world when you have smaller elements. And so when you bring this much depth of field around, you get the impression that this model is actually smaller than the real building and it's something that's about 50 centimeters or something like that all right so maybe let's go with the isometric view as well uh, some depth of field would be really good here as well so maybe depth of field here and then let's go with focus distance this model right here 
And then what I can do is, I think this is way too much. Maybe let's go with 10 again. All right, this is pretty cool. We get this nice depth happening. Uh, maybe 15 even. I'm going for a very, um, very subtle feel here with the depth of field. All right, maybe 10 was nicer. All right, pretty cool. Let's just save this as well. And I think it's time we try out some different environment here, maybe something with more shadows than diffused environment like this. So I found out that this one was working pretty well for this task and we're getting some shadows here now. And I'm going to use control and left click to rotate this to have some elements that are in light and then other parts of those would be in dark. So we get some more emphasis on the forms that we have. And I think this is working pretty well, but I think the shadows are too sharp, but I mean, you might just wanna go for this, but for this tutorial, I'm gonna make them a bit softer. So I'm gonna go to the contrast here. I'm gonna make it 0 0.5. And that means that anytime you have lower contrast, you're gonna get softer shadows. And I don't like the green background I'm getting here, so I'm going to go to color here and I'm going to go with white so that it's in more harmony together. And you can see that a part of this model is being lit differently than the others. That's because the tune material doesn't take the light it has from the environment itself, but it just lights itself up um, with some occlusion. But I want the whole thing to be more coherent now, although this is a very nice style, but we already learned this one, so I'm just gonna go for something else. Maybe I'll just use wood so we can get more of that maquette effect here. So I'm gonna go to materials, wood here, and I'm going to drag this material right here onto my model. And you can see the wood effect happening pretty, pretty nicely, and it's being lit perfectly with the rest of the environment as well. But maybe you like the lines that we had from before. So if you wanna bring some of those lines back, what you can do is go to your material. And this is something we didn't cover in the materials uh, session. So I'm gonna go to this material right here and I'm gonna go to material graph and I'm gonna get this nice texture here, which is the contour texture, which if I just use it separately for the diffuse here, I'm going to get basically white um, diffuse with the contours highlighted. But if I double click on this and go to its setting, uh, I can also change the contour width. I'm gonna go for 0 0.5 here. And then we have the contour angle like we have it in the tune materials. So the lower you make this a contour angle, you're gonna get more contours from your model. So if I make it 30, we're gonna see we have a lot more contours here. Maybe if I make it one, we have a lot, lot more now, but this is way too much. Usually I go for 30. But we lost the uh, wood texture, right? But what we can do is get this wood texture right here and go to this plus sign on the contour texture and assign it to its background. And we can see for the background, instead of using white now, we're using the texture, which means you have the tune effect happening, but with the um, texture of wood, which is really, really nice if you ask me. All right, let's talk about proportions a bit. Right now I have a 16 by nine image, and maybe this is cool since we have a full HD proportions going on, but maybe also because I wanna upload this to Instagram, I'm going to go for more of a portrait image than a landscape image. So to change that, you can go to image and go to presets. You can either edit custom or use one of the preset, which most of the time suffice perfectly. So if you're going for more like landscape images, you can either choose one of these, or if you're going for more of a portrait image, you can choose one of these here. and one by one would basically give you a square image, which would cover a bigger portion of the screen in case of Instagram. But let's go for three by four, which will cover even a bigger portion of the screen because it's in portrait. And maybe you lose a bit of the proportions. Maybe we need to zoom back in here and that will make us lose the focal point that we had from before. 
maybe let's just do this here. And since that happened, let's go back to our camera here and go to the focal point here again and just pick a new focal point for us. And I think this is way too much. Let's go for 10 instead of six for the f-stop. And I'm just going to save this now. All right, maybe let's go for more centered view and save again. So when we do that, you need to realize that if you go to your other views, they also take the same proportions. So be careful about that. And the thing is, they all share the same environment right now. So if I change the environment here to something that I like and I go back to my other view, it's gonna have changed here too. But that's not very good every time. So what you can do is just add a camera and an environment studio instead of just adding a camera here. So when you do that and say add an edit, you're gonna say that you have a camera and an environment here that you can set. And so this one has a separate environment than this city view that I'm just going to um, add a camera and an environment studio separately. So which means that if I change the environment here and I go back to my other studio over here, they're gonna have separate environments, which is really, really nice and gives you a lot of control over what you can do. So before we start to render this thing, I'm going to go to image here and I'm gonna set my image style to be photographic and not basic, which is gonna give us a lot more control over what we can do when it's rendering. So we basically have the chance to post-produce it without Photoshop directly in Keyshot. So to render this, you can go to render here and then render again, or you can just go with control P. And then here you can just basically name your final image, go with the folder that you wanna save it in. You can decide with the format. You can go with PNG if you're saving a transparent background or any of the others that you like. I'm gonna go with PNG for now. You can decide your resolution, which is absolutely a part of the proportion that you decided here. So in case you see that your number is low here, um, you can decide your final resolution right here but it has to have the same proportions as your image right there. And then you can either go with resolution or print size, which are tied to one another, but you basically decide um, the size of your image here. And then you have the render layers that you can decide to have in case you wanna post-produce it with Photoshop later or any of the compositing software that you might be using. And then I'm going to go to options and then in options you can decide um, what render engine you're using. If you're using CPU or GPU, I'm gonna go with GPU for now or you can just say inherit from real time view, which means that whatever you have set here, it's gonna take that one. And then if you set to default, it's gonna be faster than if you set it to background view. And then GPU usage would be to 100% uh, for me now, but you can also do CPU and then decide how many CPUs you wanna use um, for your, I mean, how many cores you wanna use for your uh, rendering to happen. So in case you wanna do some other work uh, with it, when Keyshot is rendering, you can um, do that. So I'm just gonna go with GPU for now. And then there's the quality and you can decide if you wanna go with maximum samples and more samples means less noise or you can go with maximum time, which is something that I really, really like and then um, if you basically go with 30 minutes, let's say, and zero seconds, what's gonna happen is it's gonna render for 30 minutes straight and push as much as it can. For me, I think for this specific image, 10 minutes is more than enough with the GPU that I have. So I'm just gonna go with that. But this may vary from computer to computer. And then you have the queues, which you can decide all the views and the resolutions you wanna render. You can add jobs here and process a queue, which means you can do a batch render right here. But for now, we're just gonna do one image and go with this. So I'm just gonna hit render here. And this image is starting to render. And since we have set it to photographic, I'm gonna change the exposure a bit and have a better version of this. And then maybe we can change the white balance and get something warmer or colder. But Looks like not really, we don't need to do that. And then we can change the contrast here even and get a better juice out of this image here. 
and we can also go with either linear contrast or low contrast or high contrast i'm gonna go with low now because it looks better but basically you can experiment here or you can maybe not add contrast at all and go with the curve editing here which if i go down over here and up from right here you're gonna get more like the contrast effect we had but basically with more control on each and every part but if this is um, uh, something that you'd like to do you can also change your shadows to something let's say uh, more bright or darker shadows or you can go with midtones lights whites and highlights basically like any other um, photo editing software for now i'm gonna turn off the curves and then i'm just gonna go with contrast because it gives me what i want already and then you can also go with color if you want more uh, colors and something you can do that or you can go with less colors i like the vibrance because it gives you less colors and makes it natural but it doesn't go all the way to black and white like saturation does so then you can also denoise your image if you want to but i'm not going to do that i'd rather keep it rendering all the way and instead of blurring the image we can just uh, go with that and then there's the bloom that you can change which gives you these highlights around your uh, bright parts of your image basically if i change my bloom intensity to something like i don't know let's say five uh five doesn't go there let's do two so that's a lot more bloom but then maybe um bloom radius is not that much we can make it like 30 pixels all right this is way too much right now but uh, if you play with your bloom threshold you can decide where that bloom happens and maybe if you don't let it happen everywhere uh, you can control where that happens and i like it when it's like this so it's pretty nice um, maybe it's too much we can make it uh, 1.5 and this looks already better for me and maybe we can add some vignette around this model so if, if we do that we're gonna get these nice uh, dark um, halo around our model and then we can also go ahead and add some chromatic aberration this is something that the photographers usually try to avoid, but if you're going for more like an amateur look that someone took this image with their phone, you can use it. So when I do that, you can see what happens here is we get more like this imperfect look happening in our model and you can decide what color you want the aberration to happen with. So when you do that, you're gonna get the size of your model to not be that perfect. So right now you can see it's super crisp and nice but if i put this all the way you can see that it's getting these red uh imperfections like the color we decided uh to appear in our model and the further it goes uh from the center of your image the more it happens basically you can see more of it happen here so it happens where the vignette happens right so but i still like it because it gives me this raw look that somebody took this picture with their phone so I'm going to keep it. Maybe we're going to have less of the bloom, by the way. And then um, you can decide some layers and front plates and stuff, but I'd rather do all of that in uh, Photoshop if I have to. Right now, we don't even need to have a background plate, so it's totally fine. All right, then we just wait for this image to finish, and we have our final render, but I still think... It's already looking really good, but it has these small noises that I really don't mind. But um, we're just going to keep this to go for another five minutes and save it right there. All right, so we finished our rendering here and I opened it in Photoshop for some final tips and tricks here. So what I usually like to do is I go to, um, to my filters and I convert for smart filters so that any filter I add on top of this is non-destructive and I add a camera raw filter for a quick touch-up of this model and I um, feel like I can use some exposure here maybe contrast no I think we have a lot of contrast maybe less contrast actually would make it nice and soft and then maybe we can make the shadows darker to compensate for the contrast loss and maybe let's do higher highlights and 
clarity will just give you a lot more detail of your model. I feel like I'm not missing any of that. So maybe I won't go all the way this time, maybe just a little bit. And then dehaze, if you go down with it, you're going to get a more washed up model of your uh, render. But then uh, maybe for this one, we're going to have to go higher to get a more juicy image. And then uh, with the vibrance, if you have too much color, what you can do is go down a bit. And maybe I feel like this image got too cold right now. We'll compensate it by adding some temperature and uh, get some yellows in there and oranges in there. And uh, I feel like this will be better right now. Let's see. All right. Yeah. Uh, let's do a before and after. Yeah. I like this version more, but yeah, it's just a matter of taste. I just wanted you to know that you can always do this as well. And if you didn't know about Camera Row, just go ahead and try it. All right, guys, that was it for today's session. We covered cameras and the final rendering settings. And we also went through a heap of tips and tricks along the way. If you enjoyed this session, please hit the like button. And if you still haven't hit that subscribe and bell button so you won't miss the next session on animation, it helps a lot with the algorithm. And if it was valuable to you, it will also be valuable to your colleagues. So please share it with them. If you still have any questions or would like us to cover something specific in the future, please comment them in the comment section down below and we'll get back to them as soon as we could. Thank you for watching this Futurely Focus session today. This was Arik from Futurely and I'll see you in another session soon. Goodbye.